Chapter 11 The time came when Pampa Campana was no longer resigned to exile. She needed to know exactly what was going on in Basnaga City so that she could make decisions about her next moves. She informed Halaya Kota that she had work for him to do inside the city walls. I can't rely on crows and parrots forever, she said. I need experienced eyes and ears. And you have secret pathways in and out of the city. Yachna was furious with her mother. You're doing this because of me, she accused Pampa. To get him away from me. You're willing to put his life in great danger, just to stop me having the man I want. In the first place, Pampa Campana told her daughter, that's not true. I know you well enough to understand that you will not allow any action of mine to stop you if you're determined enough. In the second place, don't underestimate Halaya. He is well versed in underground work and in the arts of A.G. Atvas, and I'll help him, too. You'll turn him into a crow? No, Pampa Campana said. I was not granted unlimited powers of transformation. I can only use them on two more occasions, and must wait until it's absolutely essential to shapeshift. Halaya Kota will have to go in human form. You won't do for us what you were ready to do for Zerelda and Yihi, cried Yachna. That means you do want him dead, and if he dies, I will hold you responsible, I will never forgive you, and I will find a way to have my revenge. You really do love him, Pampa Campana said. That is good to know. The city of Basnaga had grown up in the shadow of a rocky mountain range. Those same mountains on which Hukka and Bukka Sangama sat on the first day, watching in disbelief as the future sprang up out of Pampa Campana's enchanted seeds. Both ends of the city wall touched the mountains, which themselves completed the ring of the city's defenses, and gave Basnaga the confident appearance of being impregnable. But Halaya Kota and the remonstrants had long ago discovered deep cavities among the boulders, and after years of slow burrowing they had deepened those caves into tunnels and created hidden pathways to the outside world, intended to be escape routes in the event of their discovery and persecution. I can get in and out, the old soldier assured Pampa Campana, and in the city the members of the remonstrants will hide me, if any of them still exist. In any case I can look after myself, don't you worry. But without a horse to carry me it's going to be a slow journey. Maybe I can steal a horse along the way, and another to get back. During Halaya Kota's absence Yachna Sangama refused to speak to her mother, and as the days wore on she became convinced that he must be dead. She imagined his capture, his torture, his terrible last moments, and wondered if he had died with her name on his lips. He was a hero whom her mother had wantonly sacrificed, and for what? What could he find out in Basnaga that would affect their lives? Nothing, she thought. So he had died for nothing, which was not how a hero should die. But he came back unharmed, riding a stolen horse, just as he had said. Everything went according to plan, he comforted the sobbing Yachna, who rushed into his arms as soon as he had dismounted, sent the horse on its way, and re-entered the forest, once again, without being transformed. There was never a dangerous moment. Nobody's on the lookout for an old nobody like me. You look terrible, Yachna greeted him. The risks, the danger, the journey have all aged you. You look like you're a hundred years old. You look as beautiful as ever, he replied. I told you I was too old for you. Halaya Kota's safe return was the good news, but the news he brought was hard to absorb. Number two had replaced the royal council with a governing body of saints. The Divine Ascendancy Senate or DAS, headed up by a certain Sayana, the brother of Vijasagar, and the city was now under this new senate's strict religious control. As it demolished the philosophies of Buddhists and Jains as well as Muslims to celebrate the new orthodoxy created by the thinkers of the Mandana Mutt under the supervision of Vijasagar, and made the new orthodoxy, which was nothing more than the rephrasing of Vijasagar's earlier new religion, the basis of Bisnagan society. This change was a mirror image of developments in the Sultanate of Zafarabad, where Sultan Zafar had died, thus proving that he was not, after all the ghost sultan of legend, and had been succeeded by another Zephyr, another number two, a zealot of his own faith, 
who had installed a religious council of protectors of his own. So in place of the old tolerances, in which members of all faiths participated fully in the life of both kingdoms, there was a separation and a sad migration to and fro between the kingdoms of people who were no longer safe in their homes. This is just stupid, Pampa Campana said. Whoever decided that our gods or theirs would want this kind of suffering had a basic misunderstanding of the nature of godness. According to Halaya Kota, most of the citizens of Bisnaga were unhappy about the new hard line, but kept their mouths shut because of number two's creation of a squad of enforcers who reacted unkindly to any show of dissent. So there's this quite small hardcore group in charge, and most older people fear and detest it, but unfortunately a proportion of the young go along with it all. Saying that the new discipline is necessary to safeguard their identity. And the army? Pampa Campana asked. How do the soldiers feel about the dismissal of members of the other religion, which must include many senior officers? So far the army has remained quiet, Halaya Kota said. I think the soldiers fear being asked to move against their fellow citizens, which would be hard for them, and so they insist on their neutrality. Vijasagar himself was very rarely seen. Age had him in its grip. He refuses to die, Halaya Kota told Pampa Campana, or that's what people say, but his body is not of the same opinion as his spirit. They say he's like a living man in a body that's no longer alive. He speaks through a dead mouth and gestures with dead hands. But he's still the most powerful person in Basnaga. Number two refuses to go against his wishes, however crackpot they may be. He wanted to change the names of all the streets, to get rid of the old names that everyone knows and replace them with the long titles of various obscure saints. So now nobody is sure where anything is anymore and even long-time residents of the city are obliged to scratch their heads when they need to find an address. One of the new things the remonstrance is fighting for these days is to get the old familiar names back. This is how crazy things are. The remonstrance had grown. Halaya Kota found many members willing to house him, feed him, shield him from unwelcome attention. It was no longer a small, insignificant cult, could now count its secret supporters in the thousands and had changed its demands. Dropping its less palatable early proposals and adopting, instead, an inclusive, kindly, syncretist worldview, which had turned it into a popular, although banned, opposition party. Its platform had the unusual characteristic of looking forward by looking back, in other words. It wanted the future to be what the past had been, and so turned nostalgia into a new kind of radical idea according to which the terms back and forward were synonyms rather than opposites, and described the same movement, in the same direction. There were handwritten leaflets scattered all over town, and graffiti on walls, but neither remained where they were put for very long. The gangs of the regime swept up the leaflets and burned them, and the graffiti artists knew that their archenemies would be close at hand. So they had to work fast. A single word was as much as anyone could put up and by the next morning it had been washed away. So it was hard to protest, and yet the effort continued. The remonstrance contained many highly motivated persons. Halaya Kota heard more than once the story of the heroic protester who dared to stand alone at the heart of the bazaar, distributing pamphlets. When the DAS squad arrived to arrest him, they found that the sheets of paper he was distributing were blank. No text was written on them. There were no drawings or coded symbols, nothing at all. Somehow this blankness angered the DAS team even more than slogans or cartoons would have. What does this mean, they demanded. Why isn't there any message written here? There's no need, the protester replied. Everything is clear. Yachna Sangama came out of their residence carrying water. Let the man rest and drink, she scolded her mother angrily. He just got back from this long and dangerous errand you sent him on, he has had a long and dangerous journey home. It has all put years on his face, and you insist on interrogating him at once, without even allowing the poor fellow to sit down. Halaya Kote drank deeply and thanked her. Don't worry, princess, he said, placing an intimate hand on her forearm. It's better that I get everything off my chest. 
My memory isn't what it was, and I should say it all before I start forgetting. Hmm, Yachna gave an unconvinced snort. I see the queen here can still twist you around her finger. Maybe one day you'll start listening to me. She walked off and left Halaya Kota and Pampa Kampana alone. What about number two's brothers, Pampa now wanted to know, unimaginative Arapali and mean-spirited Gundappa. What were they up to? Making trouble or keeping the peace? As for the brothers, Halaya Kota told her. Number two has sent them off to conquer Rachakonda, where people still follow the old Gungajumna culture. That's the word they use in that locality to describe the blending of Hindu and Muslim culture. In Rachakonda, the two cultures flow into each other, just like the rivers Ganga and Yamuna. And become one. Just like things used to be in Basnaga, Pampa Kampana said. Number two doesn't approve of it, and nor does the DAS, Halaya Kota said. So Arapali and Gundappa have instructions to destroy the great fort at Rachakonda and kill enough people to cure the rest of these ideas. Then the two of them can rule the region together. And the uncles in their castles, Pampa Kampana, asked her last question. What news of those three old bandits? They never amounted to much, Halaya Kota said. Their stories hardly got started before they stopped. Now they are old and sick and far from Basnaga, and you don't have to worry about them. They won't last much longer. When Halaya Kota had finished his report, Pampa Kampana nodded slowly. Your news about the remonstrance is encouraging, she said. The seeds of change have been planted, but it will take time before the new plants grow. I must go to Basnaga myself soon. I have hidden away like a rat in a hole and done nothing for too long. It's time I started whispering to people again. If many of the young are seduced by number two's nonsense, then it will be hard work. The wheel always turns in the end. But if that's true about the young, then it could take a long time. Still, we have to make a start. I heard that, Yachna cried, rushing out of the residence to where her mother and Halaya Kota were standing in the glade. Don't you dare tell me you'll both go to Basnaga. Literally jumping into the jaws of death, and leave me here in the forest alone? You won't be alone, Pampa Kampana said. Yuktasri is here. No she isn't, Yachna Sangama wailed. She's a savage in the jungle now, along with the other savages, spouting nonsense about pink monkeys. I'm the only one of all of us that hasn't lost her mind, and now you'll abandon me to go mad by myself alone in this dreadful place. I have to be there, Pampa Kampana said. If one wants to change the direction of history, one can't do it from a distance. What if they catch you, Yachna exclaimed. You'll make the wrong kind of history then, won't you? They won't catch me, said Pampa Campana. And time has gone by, and that cools all tempers. Also, people forget. History is the consequence not only of people's actions, but also of their forgetfulness. You're hard to forget, her daughter told her. And this is insanity. Don't worry, Pampa Campana tried to reassure her. We'll steal horses, so we won't be away too long as she passed beyond the outer edge of the enchanted forest. Accompanied by Yachna and Halaya Kota, Pampa Kampana realized for the first time that Aranyani's magic had blurred the exile's perception of the passing of the years, and, in that world without mirrors, had blinded them all to the changes in their own bodies, or, more accurately, it had preserved them unchanged, keeping them as they had been when they first entered. Now she understood why Halaya Kota, on his return from Basnaga, had looked so much older. When he left the forest, his true age had revealed itself in his features, so he now seemed almost impossibly antique. No doubt, granted such a long life by the magic of the wood. She began to work out her own age, to which she had never given any thought, in some way that she did not understand the forest had banished all such considerations from her consciousness and she was alarmed to find. As she made her calculations, that she must be at least eighty-six years old, but because of the goddess Pampa's gift of youth, not eternal youth, but long-lasting enough, she still possessed the youth, vigor, and appearance of a young woman of perhaps twenty-five. 
She was interrupted in her calculations by Yachna's horrified voice. What have you done, she shrieked. What has happened to me? I have done nothing, Pampa Campana replied. The years have passed, but in the forest we have been living in a dream. But you, Yachna shouted. You look like a girl. You look like you could be my daughter. Who are you, anyway? I don't even know who you are. I've told you everything, Pampa Campana said, with a deep unhappiness in her voice. This is my curse. No, cried Yachna. It's mine. You are my curse. Look at Halaya Kote. He looks like he won't live another hour. So you found a way of taking him from me, after all. I will live, Halaya Kote said, and I will come back to you. I promise you that. No, Yachna wept. She will find a way to kill you. I know she will. I'll never see you again. And with that she fled weeping into the depths of the forest. Pampa Campana shook her head in sorrow, and then gathered herself. Let's go, she said to Halaya Kote. There's work to be done. Pampa Campana returned to Basnaga wrapped in an all-covering blanket, crawling through the secret tunnel of the Remonstrance and being guided by Halaya Kote to a safe house, the home of a widowed astrologer calling herself Mothery Devi, a small matronly lady of about forty, who willingly agreed to shelter her. When Halaya Kote told Mothery Devi the name of her new guest, the astrologer's eyes widened in disbelief. But she asked no questions and welcomed Pampa Campana into her home. As it happened, this was a time of much upheaval in both the capital of the empire and also in the citadel of its rival, Zafarabad, so nobody was thinking about the former twice queen. And the memories of the old folks who remembered her or had heard her spoken of were fading, too. What occupied everyone's minds was the turbulence in the ruling dynasty and among the rulers of Zafarabad as well. Hakariya II had died suddenly, and so, across the empire's northern border, had Sultan Zafar II, both number twos, departing almost simultaneously. Fierce battles for power broke out in both kingdoms. Zafar II did not die peacefully in his sleep like Hakariya II. His uncle Dud, accompanied by three other assassins, rushed into his bedchamber and stabbed him to death. One month later, the assassin was assassinated himself, while at prayer in the Friday Mosque of Zafarabad. Another noble, Mahmud, took the throne, after blinding Dud's eight-year-old son, to end any arguments about the succession. All Zafarabad was in a condition of chaos and dismay. Meanwhile in Basnaga, things were not much better. Hakariya II had three sons, Virupaksh, named after the god who was the local incarnation of Lord Shiva. Bukka, yes, another Bukka, and Deva, named, simply, God. Virupaksh took the throne, and in a few short months lost much territory, including the port of Goa, and was then murdered by his sons. These sons were dealt with in their turn by Virupaksh's brother Bukka, who then became Bukka Raya II, and didn't last long either. Being killed and succeeded by the third brother, Deva, who believed that, as the actual, so named incarnation of the Godhead, he possessed a divine right to the throne. He would bring an end to the cycle of dynastic murders and rule for forty years. During the years of turmoil a second Portuguese horse trader, Fernão Pays, arrived in Basnaga, and was sensible enough to keep his head down and do no more than sell his horses and prepare to leave at a moment's notice. But business was good, and he became a frequent visitor. He kept a journal. And in it he described the murderous Virupaksh and Bukka too as being only interested in getting drunk and fucking, usually in that order. Devaraya would have gone down the same weak-minded road but he was the most easily influenced of all of them, and so, as will be seen. His story would be different, which was why he managed to stay alive and die unremarkably, of old age. The world's turned upside down, thought Pampa Campana. It's up to me to turn it the right way up again even though much time had passed. And the new King Deva Raya thought of Pampa Campana's escape as an old, long-concluded story, there was still the DAS, and somewhere there was still ancient Vijasagar, and it was necessary to be careful. 
There was an alcove in Pampa's bedroom and Madhuri Devi insisted that during daylight hours her guest should position herself inside it, and then Madhuri would push a wooden almara in front of it to hide her. At night, she would move the almara back so that Pampa Campana could come out. As an extra precaution, Madhuri would buy provisions in two places, the main bazaar which she regularly used, and where she was well known, and also a second, smaller market in a distant corner of the city, where nobody knew who she was. So that people did not have reason to wonder why she was buying more food than one person needed, and so begin to suspect that she might be shopping for two. Pampa Campana understood that her host was a seasoned and professional underground operative and did not question her rules. In her hidden alcove she adopted the lotus position through the long hot daylight hours, closed her eyes, and allowed her spirit to travel through Basnaga as it had in the early days of her whispering, to listen to the thoughts of the citizenry, and to eavesdrop on the machinations of the kings. For a long time she did not begin to whisper. She listened, and waited. It was not yet time to make her move. She did not seek out Vijasagar, because if she entered his thoughts, the wizened centenarian would certainly become aware of her intrusive presence nearby, and after that he would have the city turned upside down to find her. And her secret hideout would not remain secret very long. She saw him only in his effects, in the survival and strength of his brother Sayana, very old himself by this time, but still immensely powerful, and, in Madhuri Devi's opinion, the dark unseen hand behind all the killings. His purpose all along has been to get Deva onto the throne, she told Pampa Kampana, because Deva's vanity and God complex makes him susceptible to outrageous flattery, and therefore he's the easiest of all the contenders to control. And if that had been Sayana's plan, then it was really Vijasagar's plan, and Deva Raya was the old man's pawn. I will make it my business to get this young king out of the old brother's clutches, said Pampa Kampana, and that will be the beginning of the renewal and the return of the Basnaga we loved. It may take longer than you think, Madhuri Devi said. Why do you say that? Pampa Kampana asked. According to the stars, said Madhuri Devi, you will be married to a king of Basnaga one more time, but it won't be this one, and it won't be soon. Madhuri. You're so kind to give me shelter, but I don't really put much store in the stars, Pampa Kampana said, and then added, after a few moments, how long will it be? I don't know how this is even possible, Madhuri Devi said, frowning, but then I don't know how you're possible at all. You're somebody my grandparents used to talk about when I was a little girl, and yet, here you are looking younger than me. Anyway, the stars are very certain, and they say, in approximately 85 years from now. Too long, said Pampa Campana. We'll have to see about that. In his own time, people called young Deva Raya a great monarch, but Pampa Campana in the Jayapurjaya refers to him as the puppet king, because he allowed not one but two unseen masters to pull his strings. Falling under the spell of the two rivals whose struggle was at the heart of the secret history of Bisnaga, first, Vijasagar the priest, and then the priest's protege whom he had abused, who rejected him and became his greatest adversary, Pampa Campana herself the empire's once and future queen. In the early days of his rule Deva Raya was the obedient creature of Sayana and the DAS, which was to say, of Vijasagar, the absent puppet master. He ordered the beautiful Hazara Rama temple to be built in the heart of the royal enclosure and it became the private place of worship of the kings of Basnaga, from then on, until the very end. And the puritanism of the DAS and its intolerance of other faiths continued. Also under the expansionist influence of the DAS, he was very often away at the wars. For almost twenty years, he fought everyone in the neighborhood, defeating them all, including Mahmud of Zafarabad. All of this added to his glory. But it meant that Basnaga city was left for long periods in the hands of Sayana, who was beginning to be very old and sick, and behind Sayana there was Vijasagar, who had become old and sick many years earlier. The DAS-controlled royal council, too, had atrophied. Its long spell in power and the immense age of its senior members had encouraged laziness and incompetence, which, in turn, bred, in the less antique members, a good deal of fiscal corruption and a liking for deviant sexual practices, which the official policy of the organization strongly condemned. 
The citizens of Basnaga began to want a change. This was the opening Pampa Campana needed. She began to whisper through all the concealed hours of the day and most of the night as well. You don't eat, Madhuri Devi told her worriedly. If you are human, then you must eat at some point. Pampa Campana agreed politely to set aside 30 minutes a day during which they could share a meal and converse. The rest of the time she sat with her eyes closed, visiting the minds of the people. You don't sleep, marveled Madhuri Devi. At least, not when I'm looking. What kind of a being are you? Is this a goddess who has come into my house? I was inhabited by a goddess when I was very young, Pampa Campana replied. It changed me in many ways, some of which even I don't yet understand. I knew it, said Madhuri Devi. And fell to her knees. What are you doing? Pampa Campana cried. I'm worshipping you, Madhuri Devi said. Isn't that the right thing to do? Please don't, Pampa Campana said. I have lost one daughter to a foreigner and the sea, and left two behind in a forest. I see now that the task ahead of me will take many years, and maybe before it's done my daughters will all be dead, and Haliakota will be gone for sure, and maybe you will have come to the end of the road as well, and yet there's a thing in me that doesn't care about any of that. A thing that only cares about the task I have been set. I have turned away from my daughters as my mother turned away from me. That's not the kind of person you should revere. Get up off your knees at once. The whispering wasn't as straightforward as it had been in the beginning. That had been the time of the created generation, born from seeds, and they were blank slates, empty heads, and when she wrote their stories on those slates they accepted the narratives she was planting in their heads without making any fuss. She was making them up. And they were becoming the people she invented. There was little or no resistance. But the people she had to whisper to now were not her inventions. They had been born and raised in Basnaga, they had actual family histories going back two or even three generations. And so they were not pliable fictions. Also they had been encouraged by the authorities of the present day, the DAS people, to believe that the true story of the birth of Basnaga was a lie, and that a lie was the truth, that Basnaga was not seed-born. But an ancient kingdom with a history that did not originate in the imaginings of a whispering witch. And another thing, the city had grown. Now there was a multitude to address, and this time she would have to persuade many of them that the cultured, inclusive, sophisticated narrative of Bisnaga that she was offering them was a better one than the narrow, exclusionary, and, to her way of thinking, barbarian official narrative of the moment. It was by no means certain that the people would choose sophistication over barbarianism. The party line regarding members of other faiths, we are good, they are bad, had a certain infectious clarity. So did the idea that dissent was unpatriotic. Offered the choice between thinking for themselves and blindly following their leaders. Many people would choose blindness over clear-sightedness, especially when the empire was prospering and there was food on the table and money in their pockets. Not everybody wanted to think, preferring to eat and spend. Not everybody wanted to love their neighbor. Some people preferred hatred. There would be resistance. Halaya Kota came to see her in the middle of the night when she had emerged for a few hours from her alcove of secret inwardness. Yachna had told him he looked terrible, and now he looked even worse than when she said that. I haven't got long to go, he told Pampa Campana, and I have a promise to keep. Go, she said. From a fold of her garment, she took out a little pouch of gold coins. Go and find this new foreigner, this Sir Pays, and buy the fastest horse he has to sell. Go and embrace her, and tell her I sent her my love. She loves you too, said Halaya Kote. Won't you come also? You know I can't do that, Pampa Campana said. I have to sit in a hole behind an Almora and try to create a mass movement. Once I was a queen. Now I'm a revolutionary. Or is that too grand a word? Let's say, I'm a witch, behind a wardrobe. Then I'll say goodbye, Halaya Kota said, and I'll go on my last ride. In the Jayapur Jaya Pampa Campana tells an extraordinary tale of that ride. 
We must ask ourselves how she could know what happened, since she wasn't there. It would be forgivable to conclude that the entire episode is an invention. The poet shrugs off such suspicions. The birds told her, she writes. Years later, she tells us, when she emerged from her seclusion, the crows and parrots spoke to her in the master language. It was hard for him to go back, said the crow. First he had to bribe the Portuguese trader to bring the horse through the city gate to a secret meeting point. Then on the way to the forest he began to feel unwell. As he neared the forest he developed a fever and entered a state of delirium, said the parrot, and he was shouting nonsense as he rode. The crow took up the story. By the time he reached the forest his mind had gone completely, and he no longer knew who he was. All he knew was that he had to get into the forest to see her. But, as you know, for men who don't know who they are, or have forgotten, the forest is a dangerous place, the parrot said. He ran into the forest, shouting her name, the crow continued. But then he screamed as the forest's magic took hold of him, and he fell to the ground, and didn't get up. She came running, said the parrot, but she was too late. When she reached the fallen figure, it was no longer Halaya Kota, her beloved, the crow declared, with great solemnity. It was a dying woman who looked a hundred years old, the parrot sadly said. And the woman was wearing the old soldier's clothes, added the crow.